What's up everyone, this is an interview I just did with Leonard Kamner from Bora Hansgrohe, winner of a stage in the Dauphiné this year. If you prefer to listen to it in podcast form, it's obviously on the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast as part of our Tour de France wrap-up for the first week and Torino Adriatico Stage 1 recap. If there's any glitches or audio issues, you've got to forgive us. Leonard's in obviously using hotel Wi-Fi. I've had to travel to Canberra to see my father, Scott Morrison, for Father's Day. But I hope you enjoy the interview. Go and check out the podcast. If you're in the UK, I always did a video on ITV Sports YouTube channel for Stage 9, which was epic. Welcome, Leonard Kemner. Future Vuelta a España, GC podium. Maybe even winning the Vuelta a España pretty soon. Future Tour de France stage winner. So what's happened today? Anything different in like a COVID Tour de France on the rest day for you? Yeah, we need to do the COVID test. That's uh, actually one of the biggest difference and also that we don't have any media in the hotel like uh, we only do it per yeah call and maybe via skype or now via zoom so uh, that's the biggest difference you have actually a quite relaxed rest day to be honest because absolutely no stress that's what I'm, i'm wondering is after the tour de france finishes maybe riders will say I wish the Tour de France was always like this, like a little bit less crazy, like less fans. There's still fans, but is it is it nicer not having so many fans and just like so many prep media people all the time? Like you've done mm-hmm. tours before. Like is it is it better that way? No. Nah. For example, after the stage, you normally do like one interview in the mix zone and everybody has his microphone there and then you're done. And now okay. you have to tell uh, like three times in a row the same thing, and it's actually pretty <laughs> annoying. And uh, also with the, with the fans, <laughs> yeah, but uh, normally it's like pretty crowded, and um, yeah, you can feel for three weeks a little bit like a rock star, and uh, now it's everything a little bit more quiet, only on a few yeah big mountains with a lot of uh, historic background. You have a lot of spectators, and the rest is uh, super calm. So uh, actually, there is something missing on the tour for sure. So I wish uh, we have a normal one again. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Hopefully next year it'll all be fine. I mean, I'm glad that you guys are still able to ride the tour. Um, and, yeah, thanks for calling in at midnight Australia time, early day for me today. So how has the first week been? It's like a, you did the Vuelta, I think, in 2017. It, a lot of people said like a thousand times it looks like a Vuelta first week sort of profile. What was it like having a mountain stage on stage two and yeah has it been a different week because of the profiles or has it still felt like a tour de france profile i only did like one tour before last year and there we had like uh, everything in brussels the first three stages that was like yeah it was hectic and uh, uh, more narrow road so it also was super stressful now we had like this crazy first stage which was like completely crap and then uh, yeah we went to the second one which was uh, immediately yeah relatively hard from the profile but we didn't run so hard the first two climbs and started we racing like the last two climbs so it was actually uh, okay when i remember 2017 in the vuelta i was suffering big time especially in the first week i was actually only in the wheels and i was thinking like wow how can i survive this uh, grand tour and uh, this time it was i had a better shape and uh, it felt uh, much easier than the vuelta actually yeah so I felt like, I mean, I, I got no idea exactly what, how hard the stages are. Like when you're looking on TV, you can't really tell how hard it is. But on that uh, stage six, like Monte Gual, the the first sort of mountaintop finish when Ineos went to the front, yeah, I was pretty sure I was like, that's not actually that hard a pace for guys like you and the GC guys. It seemed pre- pretty easy. And then the stage that Pogaccia set the Perisul climbing record, it seemed like the first half, again, like the breakaway went, Mitchell and Scott not chasing, and then like yeah. easy again. And then it seemed like everyone just smashed it up Perisul. Was the was stage six being maybe a little bit easier than people expected? Did that feed into you guys going absolutely crazy on stage seven when you did? I think I'm pretty sure I looked, I saw your power data, you did 8,000 watts for like at least two minutes um is that was stage six being easier did that contribute to stage seven what you did or were you going to do that anyway was that always the plan to get peter Mm -hmm. in the break or split it yeah actually stage seven was uh it was planned a little bit different we have like a hard race in the beginning and 
made these jumping, but uh, after one and a half K jumping was already over and nobody wanted to go in the group. So yeah, we, we changed plan and uh, Max Schachmann was absolutely drilling it uh, up to that climb. And in the end, Felix, and I was in the back with uh, Emu. We were like on place uh, 50, 40 and it was, it was like a proper all out to just uh, stay on the wheel. And I was like, stop it, stop it. And from kilometer 18 on, I was like also in the in the echelon uh, and uh, pulling. And I was like, okay, if we go a little bit faster, I get dropped. And I don't know if I ever see the finish line again. So I was like, this is, this is proper hard now. But in the end, it was okay. Like uh, after the first 50, 60K, we, we had like a big enough uh, gap. And then we could ride like with yeah, 300 watt. And can you confirm that it was the climb at the start, that category three climb that split it? Or was it the crosswinds yeah. after? But it, I, I thought it was actually the climb that split it and then like the little crosswind section afterwards just, I guess, made it easier for you to keep mm. that gap. Uh, or was there crosswinds like straight from neutral flag? Yeah, it was uh, on the climb. It was even on the climb it was crosswind because it was a really open climb. So uh, yeah, everybody was hanging in the line and was even going up. So it was like absolutely bad to be in the back you had absolutely no advantage of slipstream or something so it was also mentally hard you see some guys pulling in the front and you're hanging in the line heart rate i don't know almost on the peak and uh, then actually we had like where we expected we had headwind and uh, that was relatively bad for us because normally we could have uh, made it even harder on the there was one turning point where we went like down and then we had a hairpin to the left and that was also where like everything went really hard but we needed to pull like pull pull and if we have a little bit of tailwind there everything would have exploded i think even more and that kind of goes into my next question one of the people asked because i said oh, i'm interviewing leonard send through your questions and one of their question was how do you deal with as like you're there i think you primarily as a domestique but maybe stage wins now but we'll get to that later how do you deal with sort of two priorities as a domestique rider where one day you are pulling in sort of the echelon for Peter Sagan and the next day you are riding like as domestique for Emu. Yeah, maybe on that day it was uh, difficult on these two days. Uh, normally, to be honest, we don't do so much for the green jersey as uh, because we have almost like a, a climber squad we are here mainly because of a good gc or we were here because of a good gc and um you can also see it like it was schachmann it was Großschatten, Mühlberger and me we are not uh, really specialists for crosswinds and uh leader of train this is not uh, what we are here for so it was in that moment a little bit weird but it actually worked out pretty well because also with us you have somebody who can give like a good um or you say it, command, you can set a good pace. And uh, they also say like, okay, now you can recover a little bit. Uh, I take some turns and that was pretty good. But I think if you do it for more than two days, like if it would be the next day again that we have to do full gas uh, sprint lead out or chasing, then uh, it would have been a big problem, I think. Now it was okay. Yeah, and like I got, I took a photo. I tried to take two photos, and I think you were on the front of of the first echelon, and Tim de Klerk and Remy Cavagna were chasing, and you were gaining time on them. And I was like, Leonard needs to take this photo and put it on his wall because, like, mm. yeah. <laughs> he had the quick step yeah. classics train chasing, and you were gaining time on them because they must have been like completely blown apart from that climb. Yeah, I guess so. Normally, Cavagna and Tim de Klerk are insane. When they pull in front, you are normally suffering in the back. So, mm. uh, yeah, we had a good uh, good spirit. We went smooth. And I think that was maybe our biggest advantage, that we were relatively constant in our turnings and everybody could recover a bit. And it's also a difference if you go with four guys doing turnings or if you are with two guys in the back trying to yeah bridge across. And then you are more like going fully deep for like two or three minutes trying to get that gap down and when you then uh, don't make it then you have like lactate i don't know 10 11 and then you are missing more and more time because you cannot uh, do a proper yeah 
chasing anymore. And I mentioned it sort of when I was asking one of the questions. I said you did 8,000 watts for two minutes. That's probably not known that well outside of Germany. Could you explain the 8,000 watts meme to people? Or or is it not possible to explain it? Uh, I think it's hard to explain. It's like uh, just a a guy who started like two years ago with uh, random videos where he was saying uh, 8,000 watts. He was asking like some uh, shipper man, like how much does this engine have like uh, power? And then uh, he's saying something and he just asked with uh, answers with like yeah, 8,000 watts. So it's something completely weird, but it's somehow funny. We also say that only big chain ring. And um, ah, it's hard to, hard to explain. I just like the guy and uh, I think it's funny if you see 8,000 watts and uh, only big chain ring. It's just stupid talk. <laughs> yeah and like that's why i like half the things i like about cycling are just random memes and just random funny things i see or photos like the cycling out of context twitter account where he just takes random stu- like photos of people doing stupid things in the race is like half the reason why i watch cycling to be honest but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned in one of your when you were responding just then that you were there for gc uh you don't have to answer if like Bora doesn't have an official position on it yet, but are you going to get full license to go stage hunting now? I saw that from you yesterday when you were trying to get in the break. Is yeah, will you be riding still for Emu or focusing on stage wins for yourself? Uh, no, yesterday it was still uh, for for Emu. I wanted to be in the break to actually be able to help uh, on the last climb to oh, still be okay. in front to maybe get back and. Uh, but it was also like, if there is no problem, then I can also go for a stage victory or can try it. But uh, this time it would have been super useful to have me in the front and uh, yeah, try to chase the gap down a little bit more for Emu. But in the end, it absolutely didn't work out. And then we got actually caught even before the last climb, which was the worst thing that could actually happen to me. But uh yeah, we cannot change it anymore. And I think uh, we are all in for stage victories now, or we try to, because to be honest, with four minutes in the GC, you won't uh, do a proper top five or top 10 result anymore. It's actually, it's gone. Either you are going into a group and maybe sneak some minutes back, but normally you don't. There's 10 guys in top 10 who are actually pretty close on time gaps. Like yeah. Yates, Yates is like, 12th or 13th with only one minute uh whereas you know uran etc they're all climbing like yeah pogacha set that record on Perisud on stage eight but also the other riders were not that far behind him either so it seems like the level is pretty good i, I just wanted to say on Perisud we had a lot of uh tailwind actually so even really? the Gopetto we went quick with uh not so yeah. many watts i know and i just said it on the podcast just before this i was like you know because People say, oh, my God, Pogaccio beat Vinokurov record on Petersul, um from 2003 or whatever. But I was like, the stage was pretty easy up to that point in the first, the first half of the stage. Like his normalized power for stage nine was higher than stage eight. Uh, still, it's like it's a Tour of France stage. It's not easy, but it's not. It wasn't full gas like from the start. He probably had tailwind on the climb and Vinokurov did that in like second or third week. So all those things... And, you know, yeah, the tailwind takes it from, what, 6.8 down to 6.5. Still great, but... Yeah, um, but I also think that the, the power data from Pogacha, I, <laughs> I'm not really sure if they are correct because they are so crazy insane. And uh, we actually catch them today in the, in the easy ride. And I was, right, I was asking one of the guys from UAE, like, how is your power meter or what kind of power meter is it is it only like um measuring on left side or is it measuring both sides and he actually said it's only on the left side it's even a carbon crank so i think you can put some watts down i cannot believe that he's doing like i don't know 430 watts over 20 minutes or something like this it's just absolutely mind-blowing with his weight and um i guess it's a little bit less I, if it's really that high it's then I really have to train hardcore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm fucked. No, his, mate, his power data and power meter, like they've had issues all year. Like, obviously, you know, I got nothing better to do 
with my time. So every time there's yeah. a like climbing performance, I go look at their Strava, um, particularly mostly like Coos and Pagacha. They've always put it up. And like his power meter or the head unit, there's been issues all year. Like he has really bad dropouts. Um, so yeah. I don't know what product it is. But yeah, what you're saying is like definitely in line with the issues they've had before. That being said, the VAM he did on Pedestal was still pretty high. So um, I don't know. We'll never know really his true watts, I guess. But yeah, you said there was tailwind. So maybe we do have to like knock that down a little bit. Um, yeah, but for sure we... it was a super great performance. This is nothing I want to uh, yeah, put down yeah. now. So it was this insane, insanely good, but maybe not as crazy as the uh, what data is showing. Yeah. And that got me to thinking, do you think out of lockdown, given that we're seeing people on pretty good form, like people doing good, seem to be doing good numbers, does racing really matter in the lead up for pure GC riders? Like, or can they pretty much train on their own and get to the required level to compete in the Tour de France? Obviously, maybe a week of racing or a little bit of racing just for the handling mm -hmm. and everything is is useful. but Like a lot of people were saying that, oh, the riders are going to come in like out of shape. Like the NBA players after the lockdown in the 90s came in like 15 kilos overweight. But to me, it looks like all the riders have been able to actually train for months uninterrupted, get a good program in, and they're at the same level. Is that your experience or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the, everything changed in the last 10 or 20 years. Maybe. If 10 or 15 years ago also the cyclists would have been in bad shape without the racing because they didn't have like the same training focus like we have now i think it's one of the biggest difference maybe between now and 2000 and um in my opinion we could also see it now after the dauphine or in the dauphine with lombardi yeah like all the guys who, who raced and crashed actually got interrupted in their build up and uh, this is actually what happens always when you start racing in february march april usually you start crashing you get sick uh, you have to go on reserve to some race where you don't want to be and uh, then always your preparation get disrupted like you were saying it and now everybody had time like some guys went like two or three times to attitude camp could totally easily focus on losing weight getting into proper shape because normally you also go to a race and then you're eating like full gas and you maybe gain a kilo again which you normally in training you don't do so you're maybe uh, it's harder to actually really drop the weight when you're racing a lot compared to when you only train because then you all have everything in mind you can check everything yourself so i think that the lockdown made it this hard because everybody is training like crazy Yeah, I think so too. Just looking at the level seems to be just as good, if not better, than in previous years. Maybe more crashes, but crashes, I guess, can happen any time. And yeah. often it's not been the riders' fault that crashes have happened. Like it was no one's fault that loads of crashes happened in stage, or none of the riders' fault that crashes happened in stage one. That was just shit weather and you know, shit descents. I, I never went on such slippy roads because it wasn't raining for months there. And then uh, it was like, It was really like soap. Uh, you were just slipping around all day. And how did that affect? I saw you still have your bandage on your leg. Do you just have like abrasions on your your knee or something, like some rash on your knee, mm. um, or are you like recovered? It doesn't really matter. Mm, in the first days, it really pulled me back from performing on uh, peak level. I was really far away from what I did like two weeks ago in Dauphiné. It seems like when you are crashing, you, you you lose some of your last percentage. Like you could also see it in the heart rate; it's not going up that hard anymore. Like it, uh, yeah, it did. And um, your body is like closing down. I, I don't know how to to explain it, but I couldn't produce. Like I had like three sixty, three sixty over twenty minutes, and I started to get dropped, and uh, I couldn't push more. And normally, it's not a problem to do like around 390 or something this is possible and it was like missing out like 30 40 watts on the threshold 
Yeah, and that's what I thought with you know with Bookman. It's like it's I think it's great that he's at the tour, and hopefully he can like keep getting better into the third week. But that crash he had, there's a price to be paid for crashing, as you said. You know, even if he's still there, the, re- the energy it takes to recover, especially he had quite a bad crash too. The energy yeah. it takes is going to take something out of you. What do you think is going to happen in this second week? Do you think the intensity will increase a bit. A lot of guys have now lost a lot of time on GC. And I think we saw that yesterday, like three quarters of the peloton tried to get in the breakaway for 60 kilometers. Um, yeah. what, what do you, how do you see the race panning out in the next week before the next rest day? I think we could also see it last year. It was almost the same. Like when it's, when the GC riders who are yeah, not in shape or had bad luck, trying to get into the breaks, it's really get hard. And um, I think this will also happen next week. Always when we have like a mountaintop finish or a hard stage, everybody will go nuts to be in the break. Who do you think is the strongest team right now? It looks to be, I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious answer, Jumbo Visma. They, you tried to get in the break yesterday and they had people pulling hard the whole time. Are Jumbo Visma the strongest all-around team? Yeah, sure they are. Uh, I don't think that uh, any team can match up with them. I think they did a pretty bad mistake with taking Tom Dumoulin out of the GC already. I think that was really not smart from them two days ago. And I also don't understand it. If I see him just pulling there and then getting a minute or something. Ah. I, think no, that I, don't, I don't agree. Mistake. I don't agree. Because right. like, how, how can he be competitive on GC if he's getting dropped off Wild Van Aert's wheel on the first HC climb of the tour on Porto Ballet. Like, Wav Van Aert was dropping him off the wheel and it was just because they were at the end of the climb that he didn't get split from that group. He went from third wheel back to the end and then luckily the crest came. Like, I mean, but I, again, I'm biased. Before the tour, I was like, no chance. He's competitive on GC coming back yeah. from 400 days. I don't know. I think he's not, not much weaker than he was when he won the Giro or when he went second okay. in the Tour. I think he's maybe almost on the same level. But for sure, the concurrence is maybe a bit uh, higher. And also, I don't know if it's mentally or something, if he doesn't like it with the second leader. But I, I really, before the Tour, I was really thinking that he can do like for sure podium. Because he, he looked strong in the Dauphiné. There he did like a lot of work also for, for Roglic and um, yep. was still still there. Now he didn't look so good, to be honest, in the Tour. But uh, I was also thinking maybe the second week he feels better or the third. And uh, for me, it still, it was absolutely not necessary to uh, lose the minutes with him. Like uh, also when he didn't look the best, it was still not the... Uh, they didn't chase somebody back. They didn't uh, make Primoz Roglic gaining such a huge gap that it was really a, an advantage. So they didn't want every, anything with uh, dropping out Dumino out of the GC. So they didn't gain something from it. It was just they did it and it happened, but th- there was no outcome in my opinion. 100% agree with what you just said there. I'll, what I disagreed was I didn't really see Dumoulin as like a genuine contender complete, compared to like Bernal, Pogaccia and Roglic. But yeah, totally. to your point yeah. about why was he pulling so hard on that climb and then Roglic didn't attack. The opposite, right, is Ineos on Montaguel, apparently Bernal not feeling that good. So they just went on the front 5.3 watts per kilo and no one really attacked, but they weren't putting their own riders under pressure. Whereas, yeah, to your point, Dumoulin goes on the front, drives it really hard, then leaves Roglic on his own with four kilometers left and Bernal and Pogaccio are like looking at him and it didn't really make sense. What was obvious is that uh, Pogaccio was pissed about this uh, yeah, crosswind failure of losing one minute 20 or something and he wanted to yeah, get it back. So probably he would have attacked, I guess so, because uh, he's also like an aggressive rider. He wants to win and uh yeah attack you could also see it in the crosswinds which was actually super interesting like uh i was in the second group then and yeah, it was pogaccia and uae 
Fulga's writing, also Fugacha himself. And uh, for example, I think uh, Landa or Mollema or Richie Port, they were all just yeah. in the group, not doing anything <laughs> and just let them, yeah, domestique do the work. And I was also thinking like, why are you not pulling? Like, it's not, it's not killing you now for the rest of the Tour de France if you do some turns here and you maybe get some seconds back and it's never easy to gain one minute 20 back in the GC. And if you can hold it maybe on 50 seconds or even close it down to 45 seconds, then it's, uh, yeah, in my opinion, more easy than gaining it back on the climbs. On the front of the group, Alaphilippe was pulling, Pino was pulling, Roglic even pulled some turns. So the first group, or well, the GC guys were like, hold on, we've dropped Bogaccia. And they, they were hitting it. Yeah, yeah, they also sent their domestiques there. But yeah, they were like, every second matters in a Tour de France like this. We've got a stage 20 individual time trial if someone loses you know people are going to lose positions on gc by maybe small amounts and tomorrow speaking of crosswinds everyone's been talking about all oh, stage 10 there's going to be crosswinds i haven't looked at the wind forecast uh that's what i got to do before i go to sleep uh just look at the wind forecast for 30 minutes and try and work things out but um what when there's a crosswind stage like that what is the ds saying to you before the stage are they just saying pay attention or keep him there or is there something more sophisticated that they might say mm. yeah sometimes you have some some really important points in the race where you have to be in front where it's like so obvious it's going to be a crosswind that you that they're saying out oh, there there and there you have to be 100 in front with as much guys as possible but at the two difference it's so hard to get with the whole team on a crosswind stage to the front it's like almost impossible because you cannot stay on on third or fourth wheel it's like everybody is bumping into you you have actually no chance of even holding the wheel of your guy in front of you so you're basically just trying to be in the front all day and trying to do it somehow with the group or with your teammates but in the end uh, it's just a bit of luck and also a bit of uh, who has the biggest engine to just take a side and go full gas that's why I think people are like, oh, Ineos not looking that good this year. And it's like, I think people are underestimating how hard it is to get the whole team with 40Ks to go in stage seven and line it out and then drop the other riders with a team that they didn't even have Luke Rowe there. You don't just decide to do that and, oh, then you make it happen. It's like actually a really hard thing to do. Um, yeah. And keeping like Bernal, I think, is actually underrated in crosswinds. Like Bernal and Quintana, I know it sounds like a joke. But since 2015... Oh, they're always there. Yeah. Same with Pigita. He's always there because they're good in positioning. And then uh, with some good teammates, you, you're always in the front. It's not about uh, not only about the data. It's also about where do you get into the crosswind. If you're on position 60, you can have as much power as you want. You won't make it back. But on position 20, it's actually pretty easy and uh, not a big stress. And I think what uh, Sky or uh, Ineos did on that uh, stage in the end was like masterclass to be there with uh, three or four guys. I don't have it in my eye perfectly, but it was really not easy to be there with your team all together being the first into that uh, corner. I did a video on it. I was like, yeah, I called it Ineos crosswind perfection because it was, yeah, it was really impressive. Which stages, or maybe you don't want to give it away, but which stages do you think there might be a breakaway that you could be interested in for in the next week or even the next two weeks? To be honest, I, I don't have it in mind. Uh, I checked all the stages, but I don't mark the, them like in red because before the tour, we had like the plan that I'm going to be the domestic for Emo Buchmann. So I didn't mark some stages where I really want to go for myself. But I think we are just looking now from day to day. And when there's a mountain stage, I actually will try to be in the break. <laughs> And uh, every chance we have now, I will actually try to be there. Well, I'm sure the comments on the video will have lots of informed opinions on which which breakaway you should go in. People always have an opinion on, on that. Excuse um, me. I, I, will, <laughs> I will definitely look it up. Eh? Maybe have some, good, <laughs> some good plans and tactics for me. They'll, they'll tell you exactly the what's <laughs> yeah. to do and the what exists. Just do you know, for six each and a half words. Yeah, for 20, it's just like that. What do you see for yourself in the next like three to four years? Do you have ambitions to become 
GC leader for one week races or maybe some smaller stage races or you want to be a grand tour leader in the future it's really hard to tell like uh, before this season i was like okay i would like to try to the swiss to go for a gc there because it's normally a race which shoots me long climbs and uh, not super hot so i was like this is maybe perfect for me also yeah i think uh, this year also showed me that i'm i'm actually good on climbs especially as hard as it gets yeah good for me if i am in the top shape if i'm not in top shape it's actually not good for me but it's uh, for everybody the same and uh, for next year I, i want to yeah even step up from my actual level train a bit better in winter and uh, some other periods so i still think i have some uh, potential left and uh, maybe also a grand tour at least in my career i want for sure want to try it one time to uh, cost contest for gc I'm not talking about top three or top five, but at least to try it and see if I can make it into the top 10. Because this is already absolutely not easy. This is a big task. If you if you make it into the top 10 in the Grand Tour, you're really a good rider. And some guys are actually, yeah, often think, yeah, okay, if you contest for GC, you have at least go to top three or top five. But this is such an insane level and it's so hard to do that. So if I can ever make it, I would be super proud of it. Yeah, and just not even having the insane level for one day to not make a big mistake for 21 days as well yeah. and lose five minutes is the other skill as well that, you know, the sky, uh, except when they're crashing, but otherwise, like sky don't lose time in crosswind stages or Ineos, you know, it's, it's things like that as well, which make it so hard to, yeah, contest a podium for GC. But now the important question, what is your top three power rankings for German rappers right now and where does Jesus sit in those rankings? I know I have my own rankings, but yeah, I need I need yours first. Oh, it's hard to tell to be honest because I'm mostly listening to SSEO. If I'm <laughs> doing German rap, it's like my absolute favorite from them, that's for sure. And the second one would be uh, Zido and uh I think the third one is maybe not from Germany. It's Apache. I don't know if you know him, but uh, that would be the third rapper. Yeah. So for context, when Leonard won his Dauphiné stage win, I think you'd seen maybe my Ulrich montage, or not? Maybe you'd seen the Bora, the uh, Sibiu Tour montage. Yeah, which I matched with Jesus, awesome. and yeah, it like doesn't make sense, but that's why it's funny. And yeah, Leonard was like, "No, Jesus, SSEO." Uh, for my montage, please. And yeah, if you win World Tour stage, you get to pick the music for your own montage. That's how it works. Like, I, I have some good uh, su suggestions for the next uh, victories if I can get some. <laughs> okay, yeah. If you if you win Tour de France stage win <laughs> for sure, <laughs> you can pick the the music for your montage. Anyway, thanks, Leonard, for joining us for this rest day recap from your hotel room. I'm perfect, in Canberra. Perfect. It's been pretty pretty chill. I've enjoyed it. Maybe we'll have you back on when you, if you win a stage or you know, maybe later in the season if you do welter. But uh, otherwise, thanks for joining. Any last comments for the Lantern Rouge fans or Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast fans? No, nah, no comment. Just enjoy it and uh, SSEO is the best. <laughs>